Good morning and welcome to Pursuit Church. It is so, so very good to see you here today. Welcome. We're going to uh, stand. We're going to sing some songs of praise. Welcome to those who are viewing online as well. We are so glad you're here as well. Let's sing some songs. Let's glorify his name. Sing loud so he can hear too. Let's, let's glorify his name. Sorrow and dead in my sin. 
lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began, ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Come on, sing this song. Oh, your grace. Oh, your grace. I'm a prisoner no more. Amen. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, rejoiced as though heaven had lost but then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand that's when death was arrested my life began oh your grace free washes up conference a couple weeks ago and we were um, we were singing a song one day and I had happened to be walking in from the back of the room at this point and I saw about what looked like about 3,000 teenagers all with their hands raised and they were singing these words that just said Christ is my firm foundation the rock on which I stand and I just started thinking and if they believe that, if they believe those words that we're about to sing, that he won't fail, that he is the rock that they can stand on, they're going to change the world. 
And so I thought, man, what if we, what if we brought that song and maybe tried to bring that moment back here with us? And so we're going to sing this song together. We're going to teach it to you guys called Firm Foundation. And even if you don't know it yet, that's okay. Once you get the words, make sure you sing loud with us. And if you don't know the words, just kind of let them sweep over you until you get it. But let this be our declaration together this morning that Christ is our firm foundation, the rock on which we stand. That again, say Christ is my firm foundation. Christ is my firm foundation. He's the rock on which I stand. And everything around me shaking. I've never been more glad than I put my faith in Jesus. He's
first verse again. Sing, Christ is my firm foundation. out all my life.
Father God, in this place this morning, we love you, we thank you, we worship you. It is in this place your spirit is moving. Lord, may we be receptive to that movement, Lord. May we hear your still small voice. Bless the message as is given this morning. Guide us in this congregation, this family of believers. It is in your name we pray all of these things. Amen. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. Well, good morning, everybody, again. So glad you guys are all here today. This is going to be an awesome, fun, special day. And uh, we are in week two of a series called Breakthrough. But before we get to that, I want us to pause for just a second and, and pray again, because this week something happened in our community. Uh, There's torna a tornado that came through, and uh, people lost their lives. People lost family members. People lost homes, businesses. And uh, we just want to take a second, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about how we are being involved in helping and loving and serving the community, but let's just take a second and let's pray together and ask God to bring some healing to the brokenhearted today, to bring some peace to those who are, who are just maybe in some chaos in their soul right now. So bow your heads with me. Let's pray as we get started. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here, and God, we come with some heavy hearts today as we recognize that there are some people right here in our community who, God, who are hurting and who desperately, desperately need to experience your peace and your grace in their lives today, and God, I pray that you would help us to God, to love them well, but God, I pray that you would give your supernatural peace, a peace that we can't explain to those who need it today. God, that you would bring healing to souls who can't imagine that their soul could be healed from what happened this week. God, we love you and we thank you. And we pray that as we open your word together right now, God, that you would speak to us. God, that you would help us to experience you in a fresh and a new way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can I just tell you guys something before we jump into this? I am so excited about what's happening in our church, but more specifically, I am excited about what God's doing in our teenagers, with our students. You guys notice that they're up at the front right now? Yeah. And, and don't worry, I will pay you what I promised later. But, um, but I, I'm just so excited about, and you're going to see in a few minutes how, how God got a hold of some of their hearts a couple weeks ago when we were gone, and they're getting baptized this morning. And, and listen, I'm going to be real honest with you guys. I usually try to talk teenagers and kids out of getting baptized. Let me explain why. That sounds awful. Don't put that like on a video <laughs> clip and have it everywhere. The reason that I try to talk them out of it is because I want to make sure that they understand the decision that they're making. I want to make sure that they understand fully what it is. And so the Bible doesn't put an age bracket on this. It says repent and be baptized. Believe and be baptized. But every single kid and teenager that's getting baptized today, I couldn't talk them out of it. They were like, no, we're doing it. We're doing it. We're doing it. We understand what it means, so it's going to be an exciting day. Now, today we are in week two of a series called Breakthrough, where we are talking about what it looks like in your life for Jesus to set you free in 2023 of something that is holding you back from experiencing him fully. See, we're told in Scripture that we're supposed to experience the fullness of Christ in our lives, but I believe that many of us are being robbed of that because we are not able to experience it. And maybe you need to experience a breakthrough in 2023. How many of you would love for 2023 to be the best year of your life? Okay, almost everybody. 
Hopefully the rest of you will get on board with that at some point. And the idea is I believe that God has a breakthrough for you. And so what we're going to do in this series is we're going to take the first few weeks and we're going to look at the anatomy of a breakthrough. What are the necessary things in your life that are needed for a breakthrough moment to happen? And then we're going to look at four specific areas of your life that you may need to experience a breakthrough in. And last week what we said was that breakthrough begins with passion, with passion. You have to start caring about what is going wrong. And we said this specifically, that you need to have what we call a Popeye moment, which says, I've had all I can stand, I can't stand no more. It's got to change. Passion ignites a breakthrough. But I want to tell you guys something maybe even more substantive today, that if you want to sustain your breakthrough, it's going to take consistency. Everybody say consistency. You see, passion ignites a breakthrough. Consistency sustains a breakthrough in your life. And when I say consistency, here's what I'm talking about. I mean, if you say that you have put your trust in Jesus, kind of like what we just sang about, if you have put your trust in him and his word, and it is what is most important to you, then I want us, we need to consistently live that out in our lives. But can I tell you guys something? Okay, good. I feel like we have a bit of a consistency problem on our hands. Uh, Jesus in the New Testament may have called this a hypocrite problem, but we're going to be a little bit more nice than Jesus, I guess. Another quote that I don't want you to put on a video and send around. Anyway, <laughs> we have a consistency problem in our culture where we say we believe something, but we don't live out what we believe. We are inconsistent in how we live our lives. Let me tell you a story to try to illustrate this. It was the summer of 1997. Can anybody remember that far back? Summer of night? No, you can't. Summer of 1997, I was uh, just finished up my junior year of high school, and I was saving up to buy a car, but I didn't have one yet. That was also the summer that I fully dedicated my life to follow Jesus. And I said, and I remember this vividly, there are two things that I'm going to commit my life to. I'm going to commit my life to loving God and loving people, and it's going to be what I do for the rest of my life. And then a few days later, it felt like, I grew up in this small town called Chickamauga, Georgia, and there's not a lot that goes on in Chickamauga, Georgia, but what we would do, me and a couple of my friends, when it would be summer, we would just kind of walk around town and see what was going on, which inevitably always was nothing. nothing. But one day we walked around town and we had gotten pretty far away from the house and it was hot and we were thirsty and we we're like, we're got to get home now. And so we decided to do what you used to be able to do back then. We decided to take the shortcut home. You guys know what the shortcut home is? You cut through people's yards. That's right. You don't take the long way around. You just jump over fences and do whatever you got to do to get the straight shot home. So we started doing that. We were going through fields, cutting through yards. And then I remember this moment. We jumped over a fence into this yard, me and my friend. And we looked over, and about 30 yards from there was a dog. And it looked like a Great Dane mixed with a werewolf kind of thing. <laughs> it, okay, it was probably a chihuahua, but this is my story, so I'm going to... And it stared at us for a second, and then it started growling, and then it started moving towards us. And before we know it, the thing's in a full-on dead sprint running at us. The great Dane wolf is after us. Now, I would like to tell you what I did next. Since I had committed my life to Jesus, and I had committed to love God and love people, I would like to tell you that I helped my friend get over the fence, and then I jumped over the fence. But what I did do was shove him towards the dog and jumped over the fence. Three months later, when he got out of the hospital, we, no, 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 that didn't happen. That didn't happen. We both made it out alive. But what is that? What is that that we could abandon our principles so quickly, so easily? What is it that makes us abandon say, this is what I build my life upon Love God, love others. And the second that a chihuahua attacks, we try to murder someone. What is that? You see, I think that for all of us, there's this moment, and we're all going to be tempted. Sometimes it's fear. Fear causes us to abandon what we've said. For example, we could say, you know what? I've put my trust in Jesus. I trust him fully. And then we begin to get afraid at something in our life that isn't going to go the way that we think it should go. And so we begin to act inconsistently with what we say we believe about God. 
Or maybe, maybe it's not fear. Maybe it's anger or frustration that happens. Maybe something happens to you or something happens uh, because of you in your life and you get angry and frustrated and you begin to act out of your character. You begin to say that you trust in God and in his word, but you begin to live something different completely. Or maybe it's not anger or, or fear. Maybe it's just complacency. Maybe you just become apathetic to the whole thing. It's just been a part of your life for so long. Yeah, church, Jesus, we get it. Raise our hands, firm foundation. It's all good. But in reality, you start to live your life inconsistent with what God has for you. Can I tell you guys something? If you want to see a breakthrough happen in your life this year, it is going to be sustained when you consistently live as God if you believe in him, you consistently live like you trust him and his word in your life. That's how a breakthrough is going to be sustained. And let me tell you a story from the Old Testament that's going to illustrate how big of a deal this is, why this is so important, and what we can do about it. It comes from a guy named David. And David uh, is known for a lot of things. Let me kind of fill you in a little bit about the life of David. When he was just a kid, the, one of the young ones in his family, he was out shepherding in a field because that's what you made the youngest ones do. And a, a prophet of God showed up one day to his house and said, we're going to anoint the next king from this family. And all of his older brothers lined up because they thought it was going to be them. And guess who it was? David, of course. And so from that moment, he knew that God had a special purpose, that God had anointed him to be king over Israel. This is a pretty awesome moment. And God said, even with all this, your family line is going to accomplish incredible things, incredible, incredible things. There will be no end to the reign of your kingdom. So that's a pretty special moment. And then fast forward a few years, David shows up to a battlefield. Now he's too young for the army at this point, 14, 15 years old, I guess. And he shows up and his brothers are all fighting, though, this war against the Philistines and he shows up to deliver a care package to them and there's a giant named Goliath. you guys do know the story this is going to be great a, a giant named Goliath and and this giant is challenging the armies of Israel they're challenging God himself he's saying if anybody can come fight me you guys win and David said why is nobody going out there to fight him why are we all afraid don't we trust in God and so David picked up some rocks slayed the giant cut his head off and took all of his stuff as souvenirs now this is what David built his life upon God I trust you completely and there is nothing to fear David was called a man after God's own heart. He wrote poetry and songs. He wrote parts of the Bible that are our favorite parts of the Bible. We'll read some in a little bit. This is who David was. This is his character. This is what he built his life upon. But now David finds himself about seven or eight years removed from the whole Goliath situation. He is now a captain of the guard. In the king's palace, king is still Saul, but David has become a little bit more popular than Saul. When you cut a giant's head off and it gets put on YouTube, you become an internet sensation in Israel, and the next thing you know, you're more popular than the king. Now, they would write songs about David to put on Spotify and Israeli radio, and it would, the lyrics would be things like this. David, or Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. They had weird lyrics back then, okay? And... Did this make Saul the king happy? No! It made him furious to the point where he was like, this cannot be this way. I'm supposed to be the one. My family, we're supposed to be the most popular. And so Saul begins to send David. He's like, I need David gone. I need him dead out of my life. And so he begins to send David on these impossible missions. Like, I want you to go to the farthest reaches of the world and, and, and take something from there and kill a thousand Philistines on your way back. And David would go and do it. He'd get two of them and kill 5,000 Philistines on the way back. Every single time that Saul sent him on an impossible mission, David would come back and he would have exceeded expectations. And so Saul said, okay, so this isn't going to work. Instead of sending him away, maybe I should bring him in close, get him to trust me, and maybe I can trick him. And so he begins to think about, but what if I invited David into my family? What if I married him off to one of my daughters? And so he says, okay, my oldest daughter, David, I want you to marry her and become a part of the family. To which David says, no, I can't do that. Who am I to be a part of a royal family like this? No. 
But through a weird series of events and tricks, Saul finally convinces David to marry into the family a different daughter. But David is now a member of the family. He becomes best friends with Saul's son, Jonathan, and they're living happily ever after, right? But then the king, Saul, decides he's going to throw a huge feast of a party. And when the king would throw a party, it would be a feast that would last for a week. My kind of party, all right? And he's throwing this party, and guess who does not show up to the party? David doesn't show up to the party. Everybody in the king's family, everybody that's connected to the king shows up to the party. Who didn't show up to the party? David didn't show up to the party. And so Saul begins to question Jonathan. Why isn't David here? And Jonathan said, well, David's not here because he went to visit family in Bethlehem. And the king was very understanding of this, right? No, the king was livid and furious. As a matter of fact, this is what the king said to Jonathan in that moment. 1 Samuel chapter 20, starting with verse 30, it says, Saul's anger flared up against Jonathan. He said to him, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman. I don't know. Don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of the mother who bore you? I don't think he likes that woman for some reason, but... As long as the son of Jesse lives, the son of Jesse is David, on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send someone to bring him to me, for he must what? Okay. So Saul's done with the subtleties. No more sending him on impossible missions. No more lulling him in. He says, go get him right now because David's got to die. Well, Jonathan, David's friend and brother-in-law, says, no, no, we're not going to let this happen. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go ahead of the armies who are going to get David, and I'm going to warn him. I'm going to tell him all about this terrible thing that's about to happen to him. And so Jonathan goes to Bethlehem. He says, David, listen to me. You need to understand Saul is trying to kill you. He's been trying to kill you for a while. I don't know if you knew that or not, but now he's really trying to kill you. He's going to send the army to get you, take you, and have you executed right now. Now, with everything that I just told you about David, remember, anointed king, God's chosen one, giant slayer, because he stood on the promises and trusted in God, writer of incredible books and poetry, man after God's own heart. Matter of fact, these are the words that David would write about God that we still cling to. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. David would write these words in Psalm 23. You probably know this one pretty well. He would write, even though I walk through the darkest valley, or your translation may say, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The man who wrote this killed Goliath and is an anointed king. How is David going to respond to the threats against his life? Well, here's what you would expect him to do. You would expect him to walk straight up to Saul and say, my God fights for me. I put my trust in Him, and I have nothing to fear out of men like you. That's what you would expect David to say, right? Or, or maybe he would, he would stand off in front of those soldiers that were trying to kill him and say, you just try. You remember what happened to Goliath? Here we go. Or maybe he would go to a quiet place and he would pray and say, God, thank you for your protection and, and thank you for continuing to protect me in the midst of all of my enemies surrounding me. Don't you think that that's what David would do? That's consistent with what he says he believes, right? But let me show you what David chose to do that was very different than what any of us would have expected David would do. David went to Nob, which is the opposite way. He was running. He was retreating. He went to Nob to Ahimelech, the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, Why are you alone? Why is no one with you? He thought somebody like David was coming to execute him or something. David answered Ahimelech, the priest, The king sent me on a mission and said to me, No one is to know anything about the mission I'm sending you on. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. But the priest answered David, well, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here. Now let's take a quick time out to understand what's happening. David, acting so far out of his character, he's now retreating, running from King Saul. He is lying about missions that he's supposed to go on. 
And now he sees consecrated bread and he says, you know what? That sounds pretty good. Let me tell you about consecrated bread. This is an Old Testament thing that would happen. They would bake this bread. They would put it on an altar for God. And if God didn't eat it throughout the night, they would take it and the priest had to eat it the next day. Could, couldn't be thrown away. It was consecrated, but it was for the priest to eat. David would have known he had no business eating that bread. But don't you think... That in this moment, when David is talking to the priest, and he's holding this consecrated bread, that it would have reminded him, oh yeah, this is the God that I put my trust in. Oh, why am I running? Why am I lying? God's got my back. Put the bread down and go face Saul head on. Wouldn't you think that would be David's reaction? Based on his character? But no. No, no, no. Let's see what David does next. So the priest gave him the consecrated bread. Since there was no bread there except the bread of the presence that had been removed from before the Lord and replaced by hot bread on the day it was taken away. Now, one of Saul's servants was there that day, detained before the Lord. He was Doeg or Doeg or Doeg, I don't know, the Edomite, Saul's chief shepherd. He's important to the story. Hold on to his name. David asked Ahimelech, don't you have a spear or a sword here. I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's mission was so urgent. The priest replied, well, the sword of who? Goliath. Come on, let's say it like we mean it. The sword of who? Goliath. Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Eli is here. It is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There is no sword here but that one. And David said, well, there is none like it. Give it to me. Now, surely in this moment, David would have clutched the sword of Goliath and he would have said, oh yeah, God is with me. Oh, that's right. I put my trust in him and he allowed me to kill this giant. Oh yeah, God is with me and he allowed me to overcome this. All right, we got a bunch of more people coming in. This is great. God allowed me to overcome this. Surely he would have been reminded in that moment, right? And David would have stopped the whole routine. He would have stopped the whole shebang and he would have went and he would have faced off against Saul. That's what should have happened if David was acting consistent with his character, right? But that's not what David does, is it? Let's see what happens. Once he gets the consecrated bread, once he takes the sword of Goliath, he fled again. Check this out, verse 10. That day David fled from Saul again and he went to Achish, king of Gath. But the servants of Achish said to him, Isn't this David, the king of the land? Isn't he the one they sing about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. So now they're making TikTok dances to go along with the songs they're singing about David. I was going to have Scott, our worship leader here, come up and show you an example of it. But we're running out of time and, and everything. So look for it on his social media. It'll be there. Um, David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. So he pretended to be insane in their presence. And while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the door of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. Does that sound like a man after God's own heart? The man who put his trust in God above all else? That doesn't sound like him. What happened is a great question. What happened to David? He was acting inconsistently with what he claimed to be true about God. Now let me tell you what happens next because it's so important. We're going to read a few more verses. But Doeg the Edomite, who was standing with Saul's official, said, I saw the son of Jesse come to Ahimelech, son of Ahitub, at Nob. Ahimelech inquired of the Lord for him. He also gave him provisions and the sword of Goliath the Philistine. Then the king sent for the priest Ahimelech, son of Ahitub, and all the men of his family who were the priests at Nob, and they all came to the king. Saul said, Listen now, son of Ahitub. Yes, my lord, he answered. Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me? You and the son of Jesse, giving him bread and a sword and inquiring of God for him, so that he has rebelled against me and lies in wait for me as he does today. Ahimelech answered the king, who of all your servants is as loyal as David? In other words, like we thought David was good. Like he's acting so far outside of his character. How would we have known the king's son-in-law, captain of your bodyguard and highly respected in your household? Was, the day, was that day the first time I inquired of God for him? Of course not. 
Let not the king accuse your servant or any of his father's family, for your servant knows nothing about this whole affair. And the king was really reasonable about that, right? Yeah. No, the king said, you will surely die. You will surely die. And him like you and your whole family. But then the king ordered the guards at his side, turn and kill the priests of the Lord, because they too have sided with David. They knew he was fleeing, yet they did not tell me. But the king's officials were unwilling to raise a hand and strike any of the priests of the Lord. The king then ordered Doeg, you turn and strike down the priests. And so Doeg the Edomite turned and struck them down. That day he killed 85 men who wore the linen ephod. He also put the sword to Nob, the town of the priests, with its men and women, its children and infants, its cattle, donkey, and sheep. But one of the sons of Ahimelech, son of Ahitub, Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled to join David. And he told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. Then David said to Abiathar, that day when Doeg the Edomite was there, I knew he would be sure to tell Saul, I am responsible for the death of your whole family. The stakes not, probably won't be as high when you act inconsistently with your character. When you act inconsistently with what you say is true about God. But I bet there are consequences. When we act inconsistently with who God has called us to be. When we act inconsistently in our lives. When we say we put our trust in Him, but yet we don't trust Him with our actions. When we say we believe in His Word, but yet we don't act as if we believe in His Word. It comes with consequences. And I want to challenge you today. I want you to think about this for a moment. Where are you inconsistent with what you believe to be true about God in your life? Stand with me if you can, if you're able. And I want everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. And I want you to think. I want you to pray. And I want you to listen to what God the Holy Spirit wants to speak into your life. I want you to listen to what God the Holy Spirit wants to say to you. Let Him show you maybe an area of your life where you are living inconsistently, where you have lost sight of what you believe to be true about God. I'm going to take 30 seconds or so and just let God speak to you. And then I'm going to pray for us. So take 30 seconds and let the Holy Spirit show you because if you want to experience a breakthrough, if you want Jesus to set you free this year, it starts with that passion, but it is sustained by consistency. Let God speak to you and show you. Take 30 seconds, and then I'm going to pray for us. Father, we are so thankful for your word today. God, may it bring conviction where we need conviction, hope where we need hope. God, may it challenge us. And I pray that you would help us today to, God, take some moments to reflect on what we believe to be true of you. That you are a God in whom we can place all of our trust. You are our firm foundation. And God, let us live consistently. Let us make choices. Let us use our words and our actions to live that out. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can take a seat. I want to tell you guys about a couple more things before we close out with some baptisms today. Number one, I want to tell you guys that I would love for you to take a connection card out of the seat back in front of you, especially if you're new to Pursuit Church. would love for you to take that out, fill it out. And today, if you are new to Pursuit Church, today is your lucky day. Because today is 
we are having what we call starting point. And you don't even have to put that on the box because you're just already here. And what starting point is, is if you are looking for an opportunity to learn more about who we are, what we're all about, this is for you. And you get free lunch out of it, which is really awesome. Now, if you have already been at Pursuit Church and you're not new, you can't get free lunch out of it, even though we have a few that continuously try. So if you're new to Pursuit Church and you want to learn more about who we are and how you can be more involved, plan to stick around for about 20, 30 minutes immediately following our time here today. We'll just hang out in the lobby and uh, free lunch for you guys. Also want to encourage you to continue to support Pursuit Church with your giving, with your tithes, your offerings. Uh, like I mentioned before, um, the tornado relief that we are uh, seeing happen all around our county and our community, we are actively involved in that. Matter of fact, you can check out this picture here that we took. Uh, our care and compassion team uh, took this. Uh, they took a bunch of stuff over, some of the supplies. And if you want to participate and continue to help, continue, you can do a couple things. You can continue to support and give to Pursuit Church so that we can continue to love on our community. Or this week, you can actually bring some of those items, and we're going to send a message out to everybody about how you can be involved. But I want to encourage you to continue to support Pursuit Church with your giving. And one last thing. Um, I told you last week that we were launching a new global initiative uh, down in Guatemala where we are uh, joining some, a church that is already doing an incredible work there where they're serving uh, the underfunded, under-resourced kids and families of one of these uh, poorest communities in all of Guatemala. And we are going to be able to provide meals. We're going to be able to provide clean water medical care, dental care, education, all of those things. Matter of fact, one dollar a day provides all of those things for a kid every day. And so we told you that there were three ways that you could go about supporting this mission. The first way that you can go about doing it is by praying, praying for what God is already doing on the ground there. The second way is you can begin thinking about and praying about a missions trip. Later this year, we are going to be actually going down to Guatemala to work with and do some of the feeding of the kids and, and some of the medical days and work with the families in the church. So it's going to absolutely be incredible. Third thing that you can do is you can go out to the lobby immediately following our time here and you can check out the new table that we have set up for Guatemala and you can order merchandise, shirts, hoodies, soon to be coffee mugs and those kind of things and you can already get okay apparently they really like the coffee mugs up here all right all right all right nobody needs to give them any coffee okay settle in settle in and um you can purchase those and there are prices so when you pay 15 dollars for a t-shirt here four of those dollars go straight to guatemala when you purchase a hoodie here for however much it is, a certain percentage of that goes straight to Guatemala. So I want to encourage you to order. We're doing some pre-orders of these shirts, and uh, there'll be more every single week and more uh, throughout the year. So make sure you stop back by there. But you can go ahead and start pre-ordering today. Now, here's what I would encourage you to do. If you do want to buy a shirt or two or six, we have six different shirts, you can buy them all. Here's what I would encourage you to do. You can buy one or two now, and then maybe another one in a month, and maybe another one a month after that, so that we can stagger how we're giving this money to Guatemala. Or, here's the better plan. You buy all six for you today. Then you buy six for your family member next month. Then you buy six for your neighbor the next month. <laughs> then you buy six for your pastor the month after that all the way down the line, okay? So we go outside here in public at Walmart and all we see is Pursuit Church shirts. That's what we want to do. Yeah, so exciting, exciting stuff. Okay, today we are going to baptize five people. Yeah. And I tell you again, I tell you again that we had some teenagers whose lives were transformed not by coffee, but by Jesus down here in the front row. And God has really done a work in their lives. And so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to, have, uh, I'm going to have all these guys line up. Some of them decided that they were going to do a video. Some of them decided that they were going to speak. The ones that decided on a video are apparently upset about it. So if you are getting baptized today, I would encourage you guys to come on up here to the stage. 
line up right down here. Come on up. Yep, all the people that are getting lined up. Come on over here to this side. All the way over there. Okay. We are going to start with, um, we're going to start with Bella. Come on up. You can go ahead and get in. And Pastor Scott gets to baptize his own daughter. Isn't that awesome? All right, go ahead and sit down. We're going to roll this video. Check this out while she's getting in place. Hi, I'm Isabella. And the reason I want to get baptized today is because I think this is a great way to take the new steps in my journey with God. And I think this is a great way to give my life to God. And this is the reason I'm getting baptized today. All right. Go ahead and sit down. Bella. We baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah! All right. Go ahead and... There you go. Stay on the towel for just a moment. All right. Johnny, come on up. All right. Check out this video. We're going to get a little more volume on it, too. Uh, I think from doing this baptism, I'm taking another step with God and taking a uh, step forward. All right. Johnny, got my arm. Go ahead. We baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Woo! Will you hold that microphone? All right, you can go ahead and get in. All right, Kai. Kai, she's the one that we heard from last week and all that God has been doing in her life and how he has transformed it. She's actually going to speak for about 20 minutes, you said, on this? Oh, for sure. Just a few seconds to say a couple words about what God's doing in her life and why she's being baptized. I'll hold it. Okay. It's basically an outward exp expression from myself to God that I am surrendering my life to him. All right, go ahead and have it. Kai, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yeah. Come on over, guys. I love the hair shake right in the face. That was good. All right, now... You guys may not have had a chance to get to know Leah and Kiko yet. They are new to Pursuit Church, but God has been working in their lives as well. Our lives are more meaningful with God in it, so today we want to commit all of our trust and our lives to following him. Yeah! All right, go ahead and have a seat, Leah. That's awesome. We warmed this up, I promise. They're all just babies. Leah... <laughs> We baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It, yeah! <laughs> All right, Kiko. All right. It is cold. I know. It's cold. I'll tell you what. I won't keep you in there very long, okay? okay. All right. Step back for me. Go ahead and sit down. All right. Here we go. Kiko, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. All right. Yes, yes, yes. That is awesome. Now, before we, um, before we go, um, there's something that we have started, the tradition that we have now, where if you get baptized in this tank, we're going to have you sign. See, what you guys might not be able to see is right here. We have a name and a date of when a person was baptized. And so this says Lane, April 24th, 2022. And so what we're going to do, we're going to have all five of these people sign their names somewhere around this tank. I believe with all my heart that within these next couple years, we're going to have to retire this. 
because there's not going to be any space left. Will you guys stand with me as we close out our time together and pray that that would be exactly what happens, that we would have to retire this because God has brought us so many people whose lives have been transformed by his grace and his mercy. Let's pray for that. God, use us as a church. We surrender ourselves to you, much like what we just heard these people saying. God, we surrender ourselves to you. And we ask that you would bring us people who desperately, desperately need to hear your grace and your love. God, that you would send us out to Prattville, to Guatemala, and to the ends of the earth to see people's lives transformed by your grace. God, help us to be so overwhelmed by how many baptisms we have. God, that we don't know what to do with it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Remember, if you're brand new to Pursuit Church, stay for a starting point. If uh, you're not new or you're new, stop by the table for Guatemala, and we'll see you guys back next week at 9.15 or 10.45.